Was the Mayan Empire the most advanced early civilization? In some regards, the Mayas were more advanced than other civilizations. Their development preceded that of the other agrarian civilizations in North and South America. Principally the Aztec and the Inca. The Mayas were an agricultural people who in about 1000 BC settled in southern Mexico and Central America. Their territory covered Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Belize, much of Guatemala, and parts of Honduras and El Salvador. They developed a civilization that was highly advanced, not only did the Mayas produce remarkable architecture, including flat-topped pyramids, temples, and towers that are still visited by tourists today, and art, including sculpture, painting, and murals. But they developed their own writing system probably the first in the Western Hemisphere. They used this system to record time, astronomical events, their history, and religion, they believed in more than 160 gods. They also developed an advanced mathematics as well as a 365-day calendar. Believed by some to be even more accurate than the Gregorian calendar in use today. At its peak, the Mayan population numbered some 14 million. Their history is divided into three periods. The pre-classic period began about the time they originated. Roughly 1000 BC, and extended into AD 300, this was the group's formative period. During the classic period, 300 to 900, Mayan culture spread throughout the area and city centers were developed at Copan, Honduras, Palenque, Uxmal and Chichen Itza, Mexico, and Piedras Negras, Uaxactun, and Tikal, Guatemala. Scholars believe that Tikal was home to some 50,000 people and was not only a center for government, education, economics, and science, but was also a spiritual mecca for the Maya. It was in the second half of the classic period that the Maya made their greatest accomplishments in art and science. Europe would not produce a superior system of mathematics for centuries to come. During the post-classic period, 900-1546, they were invaded by the Toltecs. However, the Maya absorbed these people rather than being conquered by them. Nevertheless, by the time the Spaniards arrived in the mid-1500s, the Mayan civilization was in decline. Some historians attribute this to widespread famine or disease while others believe the decline was due to a rebellion of the people against the harsh government. Though they were conquered by the Spaniards and became assimilated into the larger culture that developed in the region, Maya Indians still survive in Mexico and Central America today. How did Greek civilization begin? Ancient Greek civilization began with the Minoans. Europe's first advanced civilization, the Minoans were a prosperous and peaceful people who flourished. 
on the Mediterranean island of Crete from about 3000 to 1450 BC. The Minoans built structures from stone, plaster, and timbers, painted walls with brilliant frescoes, made pottery, wove and dyed cloth, cultivated the land. They are believed to be the first people to produce an agricultural surplus, which they exported. Constructed stone roads and bridges, and built highly advanced drainage systems and aqueducts. At Knossos, the royal family had a system for showers and even had toilets that could be flushed. Minoans were a sophisticated people who loved music and dance, games, and entertainment. When did the U.S. labor movement begin? It began in the early 1800s, when skilled workers, such as carpenters and blacksmiths, banded together in local organizations with the goal of securing better wages. By the time fighting broke out in the Civil War, 1861-65, the first national unions had been founded again, by skilled workers. However, many of these early labor organizations struggled to gain widespread support and soon fell apart. But by the end of the century, several national unions, including the United Mine Workers, 1890, and the American Railway Union, 1893, emerged. In the last two decades of the 1800s, violence accompanied labor protests and strikes while opposition to the unions mounted. Companies shared blacklists of the names of workers suspected of union activities. Hired armed guards to forcibly break strikes, and retained lawyers to successfully invoke the Sherman Antitrust Act. Of 1890, to crush strikes lawyers argued that strikes interfered with interstate commerce, which was declared illegal by the Sherman legislation, which had not been the intent of the lawmakers. In the early decades of the 1900s, unions made advances. But many Americans continued to view organizers and members as radicals. The climate changed for the unions during the Great Depression, 1929-39. With so many Americans out of work, many blamed business leaders for the economy's failure and began to view the unions in a new light as organizations to protect the interests of workers. In 1935 the federal government strengthened the union's cause in passing the National Labor Relations Act. Also called the Wagner Act, protecting the rights to organize and to bargain collectively. When worker representatives, usually labor union representatives, negotiate with employers. The legislation also set up the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, which still works today to penalize companies that engage in unfair labor practices. The constitutionality of the act was challenged in court in 1937, but the Supreme Court upheld the legislation. The unions grew increasingly powerful over the next decade. By 1945 more than one-third of all non-agricultural workers belonged to a union. Having made important gains during World War II, 
including hospital insurance coverage. Paid vacations and holidays, and pensions, union leaders continued to urge workers to strike to gain more. Ground something leaders felt was the workers' right amidst the unprecedented prosperity of the post-war era. But strikes soon impacted the life of the average American. Consumers faulted the unions for shortages of consumer goods, suspension of services, and inflated prices. Congress responded by passing the Labor Management Relations Act, or the Taft-Hartley Act. In 1947, which limits the impact of unions by prohibiting certain kinds of strikes. Setting rules for how unions could organize workers. And establishing guidelines for how strikes that may impact the nation's health or safety are to be handled. What was the importance of Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch trial? The 1924 trial of German Chancellor and Führer Adolf Hitler, 1889-1945, and nine other men. Charged with treason for their attempted coup, in German, Putsch. Of late 1923, marked the beginning of Hitler's seemingly unstoppable rise to power. As the leader of the Nazi Party, National Socialist German Workers' Party. Hitler had gained enough of a following to believe that on the night of November 8, 1923, as Bavarian leader Gustav von Kahr spoke in a Munich beer hall, Hitler and his followers all of them determined to recreate a powerful German Empire and rid it of its mongrel-like quality could topple the weak German government. Merely by demonstrating that the Nazis, and not the official government, had gained the support of the people. But in a march through Munich the following day, the still loyal Germany regular army and the Bavarian state police opened fire on the Nazi demonstrators and their sympathizers. Killing 16 and arresting Hitler and his nine co-conspirators. Their trial began on February 26, 1924, over the course of 25 days. Aided by radio and newspaper coverage, Hitler held forth, in one case taking four hours to respond to a single question. Earning him the overwhelming support of the German people. His impassioned appeals turned what ought to have been an open and closed. Case of treason against him into an indictment of the German government. His basic argument was this, I cannot declare myself guilty. True, I confess to the deed, but I do not confess to the crime of high treason. There can be no question in an action which aims to undo the betrayal of this country. In 1918, Hitler was referring to the German surrender in World War I, 1914-18. Nevertheless, he and nine others were convicted of treason. Hitler was sentenced to five years in prison, where he wrote the first volume of his infamous work Mein Kampf, My Struggle, which revealed his frightening theories of racial supremacy and his belief in the Third Reich. Released after only nine months, Hitler walked out of prison more popular than he had been before his highly publicized trial. Who was the first to go around the world?
YC, the first to circumnavigate the globe was the Basque navigator Juan Sebastián de Elcano, c. 1476-1526, though 18 sailors who made the trip with him also claim the distinction. The trip was completed in 1522 and had taken nearly three years. In 1519, Elcano had set out with Ferdinand Magellan, c. 1480-1521, on a Spanish-sponsored expedition that became the first one successful in finding a western route to the east. Having rounded the southernmost point of mainland South America. In 1520, and entering into the South Pacific, the expedition reached the Philippines in 1521. When Magellan was killed there, it was Elcano who took leadership of the crew and guided the expedition westward. Returning to Spain as the first sea captain to go around the world. What was the Chiapas Uprising? Also called the Zapatista Uprising. It was a January 1994 revolt staged by Mayan rebels in Chiapas, Mexico's southernmost state. On New Year's Day, members of the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, EZLN, launched a coordinated attack on four municipal capitals and a Mexican army headquarters in the remote region. With the cry of Tierra y Libertad, Land and Liberty, the armed insurgents invoked the name and spirit of Emiliano Zapata. 1879-1919 Mexico's early 20th century revolutionary leader. The EZLN, or Zapatistas, destroyed government offices, burned land deeds, and freed prisoners. At least 135 people died in the rebellion. On January 12, after 11 days of heavy fighting, a ceasefire was called. The next month peace talks began between EZLN representatives and the Mexican government. Negotiations between the two sides proved to be a frustrating and lengthy process. Seeking democracy, liberty, and justice for all Mexicans. The EZLN called for government reforms, including local autonomy as well as land redistribution and other measures to aid the region's impoverished indigenous population. In February 1996 the two sides signed the San Andres Accords and agreed to more talks. But in August of that year, the dialogue stalled. The EZLN said it would not return to the negotiating table until the government implemented the San Andres Accords. Meanwhile, pro-government paramilitary groups with ties to Mexico's ruling PRI party. Institutional Revolutionary Party, made their presence known in Chiapas. There were violent episodes, the most horrific of which occurred on December 23. 1997, when the pro-government paramilitary group Paz y Justicia, peace and justice. Brutally attacked a group of unarmed indigenous people in the village of Octayal. A total of 45 people, mostly women and children, were slaughtered, and 25 more were injured. The turbulence in Chiapas is fueled by deep-seated anti-government feelings among the indigenous, Mayan, population. 
Despite the fact that it is rich in natural resources, including coffee, corn, timber, and oil. It is one of the poorest regions of Latin America, the wealth of Chiapas rests in the hands of a few. In 1990 half of the population in the state was malnourished, 42% had no access to clean water. 33% was without electricity, and 62% did not have a grade school education. It was no coincidence that the 1994 uprising took place the same day that the North American Free Trade Agreement. NAFTA, went into effect, according to one Zapatista leader. NAFTA was the death sentence for Mexico's poor farmers, who would now have to compete with farmers north of the border. In 2005, more than 10 years after the Zapatistas burst onto the scene. The situation in Chiapas remained unresolved. Why were Tsars Peter and Catherine known as the Great? The epithet the Great can be misleading, while Romanov Tsars Peter the Great, who ruled from 1682 to 1725, and Catherine the Great, who ruled from 1762 to 1796, are among the best known of the Romanov dynasty and both had many accomplishments during their reigns. They are also known for having increased their power at the expense of others. Peter is recognized for introducing Western European civilization to Russia and for elevating Russia to the status of a great European power. But he also relied on the serfs, the peasants who were little more than indentured servants to the lords. Not only to provide the bulk of the funding he needed to fight almost continuous wars, but for the manpower as well, most soldiers were serfs. The men responsible for establishing schools, including the Academy of Sciences, reforming the calendar, and simplifying the alphabet also carried out ruthless reforms. Peter's most vainglorious act was, perhaps, to move the capital from Moscow to the city he had built for himself on the swampy land ceded by Sweden, St. Petersburg, known as Petrograd 1914-24, as Leningrad 1924-91. As his window on Europe, Peter succeeded in making the city into a brilliant cultural center. For her part, Catherine the Great may well be acknowledged as a patron of the arts and literature. One who corresponded with the likes of French writer Voltaire, 1694-1778, but she, too. Increased the privileges of the nobility while making the lives of the serfs even more miserable. Her true colors were shown by how she ascended to power in the first place. In 1744 she married Peter, III, who became Tsar of Russia in 1762. That same year. Catherine conspired with her husband's enemies to depose him. He was later killed. And so Catherine came to power, proclaiming herself Tsarina. She began her reign by attempting reforms, but a peasant uprising, 1773-74, and the French Revolution, which began in 1789, prompted her only to strengthen and protect her absolute authority. 
like Peter the Great, she, too, extended the frontiers of the empire through a series of conquests. By the end of her reign, in 1796, Catherine had reduced even the free peasants to the level of serfdom. What was the investiture struggle? Also called the investiture controversy. It is the name for the power struggle between kings and popes during the Middle Ages, 500-1350. Since the Papal States played the same role in medieval society as the other states, fiefs and manors, which were held by kings, their lords, who were members of the clergy, eventually became subject to the same human weaknesses that guided the feudal lords and kings namely, corruption and greed. Popes became powerful and worldly leaders. The struggle for supremacy peaked in 1075 when Pope Gregory VII, c. 1020-1085, who was trying to protect the Church from the influence of Europe's powerful leaders, issued a decree against lay investitures, meaning that no one except the Pope could name bishops or heads of monasteries. German King Henry IV, 1050-1106, who was engaged in a power struggle with Saxon nobles at the time, took exception to Gregory's decree and challenged it, asserting that the kings should have the right to name the bishops. This was an important point of disagreement. Since kings wanted to be in the favor of the pope, and popes were selected from among the bishops. So, it was not purely a religious issue, political power was also at stake. Henry was excommunicated by the pope. Though he later sought and was granted forgiveness by Gregory, the struggle did not end there. Henry soon regained political support, deposed Gregory, in 1084, and set up an anti-pope, Clement III, who, in turn, crowned him Holy Roman Emperor. The debate over whose right it was to invest clergymen with. The symbol of office continued through much of the Middle Ages. Who determines whether a law violates the liberties guaranteed by the Bill of Rights? It is the job of the U.S. Supreme Court to decide whether or not a law impinges upon the liberties listed in or implied by the Bill of Rights, 1791. The difficult task before the Supreme Court justices is in determining what rights are implied. Such questions prompt months of hearings and deliberations before a decision can be reached as to the constitutionality of a contested law. The judicial body makes its determinations based on a majority vote of the nine justices, one chief justice and eight associates. Established as the highest court in the country by Article 3 of the Constitution, the court has ultimate authority in all legal questions that arise pertaining to the Constitution. Called the Court of Last Resorts, the Supreme Court both interprets the Acts of Congress 
including laws and treaties, and determines the constitutionality of federal and state laws, under the 14th Amendment. The court has upheld that most of the Bill of Rights also applies to state governments. How were Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt related? The two men, among America's most well-known presidents, were distant cousins. Theodore Roosevelt, 1858-1919, was born in New York City, and after a career in public service that included organizing the first volunteer cavalry regiment that was known as the Rough Riders. The ardent outdoors enthusiast became vice president in 1901, when President William McKinley. 1843-1901, died in office later that year, on September 14, Teddy Roosevelt succeeded him as president. He was elected in his own right in 1904 and went on to serve until 1909. Spending nearly two full terms in the White House. Teddy Roosevelt was President of the United States when he walked his niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, 1884-1962. Down the aisle on March 17, 1905. The young woman was marrying her distant cousin Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 1882-1945 who had been courting her since he entered college at Harvard in 1900. Franklin D. Roosevelt was born in Hyde Park, New York. Like his fifth cousin Theodore, Franklin went on to a life of public service, which bore some remarkable similarities to that of his cousin. Both Theodore and Franklin served as Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Navy, 1897-98 and 1913-20, respectively. And both were Governors of New York, 1899-1900 and 1929-1933, respectively. As Presidents, both served the nation for more than one term but Franklin Roosevelt made history. For being the only president to be elected for third and fourth terms. In 1951 the U.S. Congress voted in favor of the 22nd Amendment, limiting presidential tenure to just two terms. Both served the country in times of conflict, for Theodore it was the Russo-Japanese War. 1904-05, which he was instrumental in ending with the Treaty of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. On September 5, 1905, and for which he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize the following year. Franklin Roosevelt was one of the so-called Big Three leaders, along with Britain's Sir Winston Churchill. 1874 to 1965 and the Soviet Union's Joseph Stalin 1879 to 1953 He coordinated the Allied nations effort against Nazi Germany and Japan during World War II 1939 to 45 He too was a champion of peace having been central in laying plans for the United Nations it's an interesting note, however, that when Teddy Roosevelt ran for president in 1912, he was opposed by his young Democratic cousin Franklin, then a state senator in New York, who supported Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, in the presidential race. After Wilson was elected, he appointed Franklin Roosevelt Assistant Secretary. 
of the Navy a post that delighted him for combining his vocation, politics. With his avocation, ships, and one that certainly furthered his political career. By the end of World War I, 1914-18, Franklin Roosevelt was a well-known national figure. Theodore and Franklin also shared an interest in outdoor activities. But Franklin's participation in sports was curtailed when he was stricken with polio. In August 1921, the 39-year-old Roosevelt was paralyzed for a time. And though he later regained movement and was able to walk with braces, he never fully recovered. Through fierce determination he continued his life of public service, becoming president in 1933. He saw the country through two of its most trying periods, the Great Depression, 1929-39, and World War II, 1939-45. He died suddenly of a brain hemorrhage in April 1945. What were the Dutch colonial holdings? New Netherlands was the only Dutch colony on the North American mainland. It consisted of land surrounding the Hudson River, in present-day New York. And, later, the Lower Delaware River, in New Jersey and Delaware. Explorers from the Netherlands first settled the area in about 1610. In 1624 the colony of New Netherlands was officially founded by the Dutch West India Company. On behalf of the company, in 1626 Dutch colonial official Peter Minuit, 1580-1638, purchased the island of Manhattan from the American Indians for an estimated $24 in trinkets. The colonial capital of New Amsterdam, present-day New York City, was established there. The Dutch held the colony until 1664 when it was conquered by the English under the direction of the Duke of York. James II, 1633-1701, the King's brother. The English sought the territory since New Netherlands separated its American holdings. Under British control the area was divided into two colonies, New Jersey and New York. During the colonial period the Netherlands also claimed the West Indies islands of Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, called the Netherlands Antilles, which were administered separately from New Netherlands on the North American mainland. What were the worst earthquakes of the past century? In order of magnitude on the Richter scale they were, Chile, 1960, 9.5, Prince William Sound, Alaska. United States, 1964, 9.2, Andrinoff Islands, Alaska, United States, 1957, 9.1, Kamchatka, Northeast Russia. 1952, 9.0, off the coast of northern Sumatra, Indonesia, 2004, 9.0, off the west coast of Ecuador. 1906, 8.8, .8, Rat Islands, Alaska, United States, 1965, 8.7, Assam, India and Tibet. 
1950, 8.6, Kamchatka, Northeast Russia, 1923, 8.5, Bundasi, Malay Archipelago, 1938, 8.5, and Kuril Islands. Off the east coast of Asia, extending from Russia in the north to Japan in the south, 1963, 8.5. How could the world body have allowed such an event to happen? Particularly with the Nazi Holocaust a not too distant memory. Again, there is no easy answer. The United Nations withdrew its people when the violence began in April 1994, but some UN officials estimated later that perhaps as few as 5,000 troops might have been able to prevent the annihilation. The United States did not intervene in the Rwandan genocide. The recent images of dead American soldiers being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu, Somalia. In October 1993, had left the country reticent to involve itself in the world's hotspots. But, even with the lesson of Rwanda, experts wondered how the international response might differ today. What was Love Canal? When Love Canal, a community east of Niagara Falls, New York, made international headlines in August 1978, it was only after the neighborhood had already been the subject of local newspaper stories since 1976. And sadly, more headlines followed. Into 1980. What had become clear during these years was that Love Canal was toxic. Community residents had experienced unusually high incidences of cancer. Miscarriages, birth defects, and other illnesses. There were also reports that foul odors, oozing sludge, and multicolored pools of substances were emerging from the ground and children and animals returned from outdoor play with rashes and burns on their skin. Unbeknownst to the residents, all of these problems were attributable to the history of the site upon which their community had been built. Beginning in 1947 the Hooker Electrochemical Company had used Love Canal with its clay walls, to dump 21,800 tons of chemical waste. In 1953 the company sold the canal to the Niagara School Board for the sum of $1. The deed acknowledged the buried chemicals, although it did not disclose their type or toxicity. A disclaimer protected the firm from future liability. The canal pit was subsequently sealed with a clay cap designed to prevent rainwater from disturbing the chemicals. Grass was planted. Soon Love Canal had become a 15-acre field. The following year, a school was under construction on the site. In 1955 400 elementary school children began attending classes there and playing on the surrounding fields. Development happened fast, roads, sewers, and utility lines crisscrossed the site, disrupting the soil. While residents began to discern problems as early as 1958, when they complained of nauseating smells and incidences of skin problems. 
it was not until the mid-1970s that the extent of the hazard became evident. It was then that unusually heavy rainfalls caused chemicals to surface. A portion of the schoolyard collapsed. Strange substances seeped into basements and trees and gardens died. In October 1976 the Niagara Gazette began investigating these problems. But an official investigation did not begin until the following April. By this time, the site was a disaster, toxins were found in storm sewers and basements. Exposed chemical drums leaked substances, and air tests detected dangerously high chemical levels in homes. Further testing identified more than 200 different compounds at the site, including 12 carcinogens, cancer-causing agents, and 14 compounds that can affect the brain and central nervous system. The residents of Love Canal organized forming citizen groups including the Love Canal Homeowners Association. These groups succeeded in getting media coverage and in pressuring public officials to act. Finally on August 2, 1978, the New York State Health Commissioner declared Love Canal unsafe. Six days later, President Jimmy Carter, 1924, approved emergency assistance in New York. Governor Hugh Carey announced that funds would be used to purchase homes nearest the canal. While more than 200 families that were perceived to be in danger were moved. In 1980 problems resurfaced when researchers found that blood tests of residents showed abnormally high chromosome damage. The state recommended that pregnant women and infants be removed from homes even those that had been certified as safe. In May 1980 conflict ensued between 300 Love Canal homeowners and officials from the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. On May 21, President Carter declared a second emergency at Love Canal. This time the actions were more comprehensive, almost 800 families were evacuated. And their homes were either destroyed or declared unsafe until further cleanup could be done. Four years later, a new clay cap was installed over the canal. It was also in 1984 that Occidental Petroleum parent company of the firm that had dumped chemicals in Love Canal, reached a $20 million settlement with residents. What is the difference between socialism and communism? In practice, there is little distinction between the two systems, which both rely on the elimination of private property and the collective ownership of goods. But in theory, there are distinctions between the two. According to Marxism, socialism is a transition state between capitalism and communism, in socialism. The state, or government, still exists, and is in control of property and the programs for collectivization. Marxist theory holds that communism is the final stage of society after the state has dissolved. In a communist society economic goods and property are distributed equally among the people. Who were the robber barons?
they were the industrial and financial tycoons of the late 19th century. The Early Builders of American Business Some called them the captains of industry. The robber barons included bankers J. Pierpont Morgan, 1837-1913, and J. Cook, 1821-1905, oil industrialist John D. Rockefeller, 1839-1937, steel mogul Andrew Carnegie, 1835-1919, financiers James J. Hill, 1838-1916, James Fisk, 1834-1872, Edward Harriman, 1848-1909, and Jay Gould. 1836-1892, and rail magnates Cornelius Vanderbilt, 1794-1877, and Collis Huntington, 1821-1900. These influential businessmen were hailed for expanding and modernizing the capitalist system and lauded for their philanthropic contributions to the arts and education. But they were also viewed as opportunistic, exploitative, and unethical. Many factors converged to make the robber baron possible. The new nation was rich in natural resources, including iron, coal, and oil. Technological advances steadily improved manufacturing machinery and processes, the population growth. Fed by an influx of immigrants, provided a steady workforce, often willing to work for a low wage. The government turned over the building and operation of the nation's railways to private interests. And, adhering to the philosophy of laissez-faire, non-interference in the private sector. The government also provided a favorable environment in which to conduct business. Shrewd businessmen turned these factors to their advantage, amassing great empires. Reinvesting profits into their businesses, fortunes grew. The robber barons, especially the railroad men and the financiers who gained control of rail companies through stock buyouts, hired lobbyists who worked on their behalf to gain the corporation's subsidies, land grants, and even tax relief at both the federal and state levels. The robber barons converted their business prowess into political might. In Washington, politicians grew tired of the advantage seeking. Representatives of the nation's business leaders. Reform minded progressives complained that the robber barons lived in opulent luxury. While their workers barely eked out a living, their families teetering on despair. After dominating the American economy for decades, changes around the turn of the century worked to curb the influence of the robber barons. In 1890 the federal government passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, making trusts. Combinations of firms or corporations formed to limit competition and monopolize a market, illegal. Workers continued to organize in labor unions, with which corporations were increasingly compelled to negotiate. The Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, was established in 1887 to prevent abusive practices and in 1913 the 16th Amendment was ratified, allowing the federal government to collect a graduated income tax. Though many American businessmen and women would make great fortunes in the 20th century. By the end of the 1920s the era of the robber barons had drawn to a close.
Invented by Englishman Henry John Lawson, 1852 The bicycle had wheels of equal size and a bike chain, to drive the rear wheel. This practical design was improved again in 1895 when air-filled, pneumatic, tires were added. Mass production of the safety bicycle began in 1885. Even after the advent of the automobile. The bicycle continued to figure prominently in everyday life. In the United States, bicycle riding became a leisure pursuit that rivaled baseball in popularity. Cycling clubs emerged. The tandem. The bicycle built for two, allowed American youths an opportunity for courtship. Further, the bicycle industry produced some of the great innovators in transportation. Including bicycle designer Charles Durier, 1861-1938, who, with his brother Frank, 1869-1967, demonstrated the first successful gas-powered car in the United States, and brothers Wilbur. 1867-1912, and Orville, 1871-1948, Wright, who were the first to successfully build and fly an airplane. What was the detente? Detente is a relaxation of strained relations, particularly between nations. The detente of the Cold War era began after Premier Nikita Khrushchev. 1894-1971 rose to power in the Soviet Union in 1958 and initiated a plan of peaceful coexistence with the West. During the 1960s the United States and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, entered a phase of improved relations, which saw the signing of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, 1968. The Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, known as the SALT-1 Treaty, 1972, and the Helsinki Accords. 1975, which pledged increased cooperation between the nations of Eastern and Western Europe. Some historians refer to the détente as the end of the Cold War, while others view it as an intermission. When the Soviet Union under Premier Leonid Brezhnev, 1906-1982, invaded neighboring Afghanistan in 1979 to put down an anti-communist movement there, tensions between the two superpowers, the US and the USSR, heightened dramatically. Further, Brezhnev had been steadily building up Soviet arms during his tenure. These events brought an end to the détente. Collective control of the communist government The first five-year plan began in 1928, and subsequent plans were carried out until 1958, at which time the new Soviet leadership developed a seven-year plan. 1959-65 aimed at matching and surpassing American industry. Under Premier Leonid Brezhnev, 1906-1982, the five-year plans were reinstated in 1966 and continued until the dissolution of the Soviet Union during 1990 and 1991. Other Communist countries also instituted five-year plans, 
all with the goal of bringing industry, agriculture, and the distribution of goods and services under government control. Who was Genghis Khan? He was a Mongol conqueror who rose to power in the early 13th century. To rule over one of the greatest continental empires the world has seen. Born to Mujin, c. 1167-1227, he was named Genghis Khan, meaning universal ruler. In 1206, he was a fearless military leader, a brilliant strategist, and a ruthless subjugator, known for his brutal methods. Timujin was the firstborn son of the leader of a small nomadic clan. When he was a young boy, his father was killed by a neighboring tribe. Totters, and thus he rose to the status of chief. But instead of allowing a boy to lead them, clan members abandoned Tumujin and his family. He survived the hard scrabbled youth of a destitute nomad. But by all accounts, he seemed destined to become a great leader. By the time he was 20 years old, Tumujin had managed to forge alliances with various tribal leaders and claimed the leadership of a small clan. By 1189 he united two Mongol tribes, which he organized to conquer the rival. Totters by the year 1202. At a conference of Mongol leaders in 1206, Tumujin was pronounced the great ruler or Genghis Khan, of the unified Mongolian state. He began a transformation of the Mongol tribes. Dividing them into military units, each one supported by a number of households. He imposed law and order, promoted education, and stimulated economic prosperity. Within five years, Mongol society was changed from a nomadic tribal to a military feudal system. Thus organized, Genghis Khan prepared his troops to expand the Mongolian Empire. Genghis Khan's armies embarked on a series of military campaigns. Claiming land and subjugating people sometimes using barbaric methods. By 1213 he controlled northern China to the Great Wall. By 1219 he controlled most of China and began campaigns into the Muslim world. When he died in the field in 1227, Genghis Khan commanded the vast territory from China to the Caspian Sea. He was succeeded by his sons, who continued to expand the Mongol holdings. His grandson was Kublai Khan, 1215-1294, under whose leadership the Mongolian Empire reached its pinnacle. What was the Sino-Japanese War? This dispute between China and Japan, who had not that long ago clashed in the Chinese-Japanese War of 1894-95, began in 1937 and was absorbed by World War II, 1939-45. The trouble between the Asian powers began when Japan having already taken Manchuria and the Jahal province from China, attacked China again. 
Though China was in the midst of internal conflict with the nationalist forces of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. 1887-1975, Fighting the Communists under Mao Zedong. 1893-1976, China turned its attention to fighting the foreign aggressor. The fighting between the two countries continued into 1941 before war was officially declared by China. In so doing, China was at war not only with the Japanese, but with Japan's Axis allies Germany and Italy as well. The conflict then became part of World War II which ended with the surrender of Japan to the Allies in September 1945. What was the Great Famine? Typically the term refers to the Great Irish Famine, which began in 1845. That year crops failed across Europe, resulting in widespread hunger and disease, claiming 2.5 million lives. The famine was especially severe in Ireland, where many peasants exported their grain and millet and depended on potatoes for their own sustenance. The failure of the potato crop in 1845 was the 20th in Ireland since 1727. And it marked the beginning of the Great Famine which lasted into 1848 due to more disastrous crop failures each successive year. The crops had failed due to blight, previously unknown to Ireland, which was caused by a microscopic organism. Fungus, believed to have been introduced by a ship from North America. British charity and government relief did little to alleviate the suffering. The resulting famine was responsible for a drastic decline. In the Irish population due both to death and emigration. Between 700,000 and 1 million people died in Ireland and nearly 2 million people left the country in search of a better life elsewhere. Other severe, or great, famines include one in 1769 in Bengal. The disaster claimed the lives of 10 million Asian Indians, one-third of the population. In 1878 up to 20 million Chinese people died as a two-year drought held Asia in its grips causing widespread crop failures. It is still considered the worst famine in history. Who were the Minutemen? They were volunteer soldiers, ready to take up arms at a minute's notice. Who fought for the American colonies against the British during the Revolutionary War? The Minutemen, who were trained and organized into the militia, are most well known for the battles at Lexington and Concord, on April 19, 1775, which marked the beginning of the war. They had been alerted to the approach of the British troops, or Redcoats, by the Patriot Paul Revere, 1735-1818. After the fighting at Lexington and Concord, which left 250 British killed or wounded and about 90 Americans dead, word spread quickly of the fighting, and the Revolutionary War had begun.
When did mobile phones first come into use? Mobile communication dates back to radio phones used in the 1940s and 1950s. They were two-way radio systems that were powered by car batteries and required operator assistance. They were not very reliable, and the phones were anchored to a place, not a person. The first truly mobile phone call, in that it used a portable handset was manufactured on April 3, 1973. The caller was Dr. Martin Cooper of Motorola, who, from the streets of Manhattan, called rival researcher Joel Engel at Bell Laboratories. At NT's research arm, the two companies were in a heated race to develop mobile telephony. The device used by Cooper that day was called the Dynatac. It weighed 2 pounds and had simple dial, talk, and listen features. The first generation of mobile phones began to be widely used in the 1980s. These phones were large by today's standards and were usually installed in a car or briefcase. Transmission was via clusters of base stations, or cellular networks. The next generation of mobile phones appeared in the 1990s. The handset and battery technology improved, allowing for more features in smaller sized phones and greater mobility. These were reliable phones that people could carry with them. As more users adopted the technology, cellular providers expanded transmitting systems. In some areas of the world, usage took off to the point of near universality by 2000. Usage in the United States Though strong, lagged behind the rest of the developed world. Some analysts believed that this was due to relatively high service fees. While others cited a lack of reliability, especially in rural areas. The land-based telephone system in the United States was designed to nine nines of reliability. Meaning it can be counted on to function 99.9999999% of the time. A standard as yet unmet by cellular technology. What was the Great Northern War? It was a war undertaken at the beginning of the 18th century that challenged Sweden's absolute monarchy and imperialism. During the 17th century, Sweden had become a power in the Baltic region, gradually bringing more and more territory under its control. Even the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, had granted some German lands to Sweden. But much of Sweden's prosperity and expansion during this period had been under the rule of Charles XI, 1655 to 1697, when he was succeeded by his young son, Charles XII, 1682 to 1718. In 1697, the tides were about to turn for Sweden. In 1700 an alliance formed by Denmark, Russia, Poland, and Saxony. Part of present-day Germany, attacked Sweden, beginning the Great Northern War. Sweden readily defeated Denmark and the Russians that same year. 
but Poland and Saxony proved to be more formidable foes. And Charles XII spent almost seven years fighting and eventually defeating them. But the Russian army was to have another chance at the Swedish. And this time they were successful, defeating Charles XII's forces in 1709 at Poltava, Ukraine. Charles fled the country as the war continued and did not return until 1714. Four years after that, the monarch was killed as he observed a battle, in what is present-day Norway. Much of the country's lands in the Baltic were surrendered. And Sweden's period of absolute monarchy came to an end. Why was James Joyce's Ulysses banned in the United States? Irish writer James Joyce's, 1882-1941, Masterpiece was originally published in 1922, it had been serialized prior to then. By the Paris bookstore Shakespeare and Company. By 1928 it was officially listed as obscene by the U.S. Customs Court. The reason was twofold. The use of four-letter words and the stream-of-consciousness narrative of one of the characters. Revealing her innermost thoughts. When the official stance on the book was challenged in U.S. Court in 1933, the judge. John Woolsey, called it a sincere and honest book. And after long reflection he ruled that it be openly admitted into the United States. Random House, the American publisher who had advocated the obscenity charge be challenged in court. Promptly began typesetting the work in order to release a U.S. edition. But the court decision had important and lasting legal impact as well, it was a turning point in reducing government censorship. Prior to the case, laws that prohibited obscenity were not seen to be in conflict with the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which is most often interpreted as a guarantee of freedom of speech. And the U.S. Post Office and the Customs Service alike both had the power to determine obscenity. The government appealed the decision to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. But Judge Wolsey's decision held. What is the Y Accord? Officially called the Y River Memorandum. The accord outlined a limited and interim land for peace settlement between Israel and Palestine. It was signed October 23, 1998, by Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, 1949, and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat, 1929-2004 at a summit held at Y Mills, on the banks of Maryland's Y River. The meeting was the follow-up to the 1993 Middle East Summit in Oslo, Norway. There, after months of talks, both sides agreed to an interim framework of Palestinian autonomy in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. The Y meeting was the opportunity for both sides to make good on the promises made in Oslo. The Y Accord was brokered after a 21-hour bargaining session mediated by U.S. President Bill Clinton. 1946. 
The points of the agreement included developing a security plan to crack down on terrorism. The withdrawal of Israeli troops from an additional 13% of the West Bank, along with a commitment for future additional withdrawals. A transfer of roughly 14% of the West Bank from joint Israeli-Palestinian control to Palestinian control. Palestinian agreement that anti-Israeli clauses in its national charter would be removed. Israel's guarantee that it would provide two corridors of safe passage between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Israeli release of 750 Palestinian prisoners, and the opening of a Palestinian airport in Gaza. The Neset, Israel's parliament, approved the accords on November 17, 1998. But by December, Israel suspended its obligations in the Y, citing Palestinian failure to comply with the accords. Benjamin Netanyahu's successor, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, 1942. Pledged to resume implementing the Y Accord but at the same time delayed its timetable. Saying the measures should be included in a final peace agreement with the Palestinians. On September 4, 1999, the two sides met again at Sharm al-Sheikh. Egypt, where they agreed on a new timetable for the Y. That document was signed by Barak and the Palestinian authorities Arafat and was witnessed by diplomats from Egypt, Jordan, and the United States, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. But both Barak and Arafat faced mounting political opposition at home. Posing immediate challenges to the revised agreement, which stalled again. What was triangular trade? Triangular trade refers to the various navigation routes that emerged during the colonial period. There were numerous triangular paths that ships traveled. Ferrying people, goods, both raw and finished, and livestock. The most common triangular route began on Africa's west coast where ships picked up slaves. The second stop was the Caribbean islands predominantly the British and French West Indies where the slaves were sold to plantation owners. And traders used the profits to purchase sugar, molasses, tobacco, and coffee. These raw materials were then transported north to the third stop. New England where a rum industry was thriving. Their ships were loaded with the spirits and traders made the last leg of their journey back across the Atlantic to Africa's west coast, where the process began again. Other trade routes operated as follows, 1. Manufactured goods were transported from Europe to the African coast. Slaves to the West Indies, and sugar, tobacco, and coffee transported back to Europe. Where the triangle began again, too, lumber, cotton, and meat were transported from the colonies to southern Europe. Wine and fruits to England, and manufactured goods to the colonies, where the triangle began again. There were as many possible routes as there were ports and demand for goods. The tragic result of triangular trade was the transport of an estimated 10 million black Africans. Sold into slavery, these human beings were often chained below deck and allowed only brief if any. 
periods of exercise during the transatlantic crossing, which came to be called the Middle Passage. Conditions for the slaves were brutal and improved only slightly when traders realized that should slaves perish during the long journey across the ocean, it would adversely affect their profits upon arrival in the West Indies. After economies in the islands of the Caribbean crashed at the end of the 1600s, many slaves were sold to plantation owners on the North American mainland, initiating another tragic trade route. The slave trade was abolished in the 1800s. Putting an end to the capture of Africans and their forced migration to the Western Hemisphere. 